Many thanks to the organising team for inviting me to participate in the conference this afternoon. And special thanks must go to Rory and Duncan for getting everything to run so smoothly. In the short paper, I present a rediscovery of the archaeology of female monasticism in medieval Ireland. This is a rediscovery, as while it is known that women were present since the onset of Christianity on the island of Ireland, the traditional narrative of monastic archaeology has downplayed the majority of them. For the later medieval period, with the introduction of the continental orders, there were many religious houses, including nunneries, which in comparison to the religious houses for men, have been completely understudied. This paper will be in three parts. First, the evidence for communities of holy women and nuns and their archaeology will be introduced. Second, we will interrogate some of the popular perceptions surrounding female monasticism and nuns. And finally, we will share some conclusions. The time period we are considering is the Middle Ages, which archaeologists divide into the early medieval or early Christian period, starting in the 5th century through to the 12th century. The later medieval period period begins about 1100, when the processes of church reform begins, and which ends in the 1540s with the dissolution of the monasteries. From the onset, I should point out that there is no one distinctive architecture or archaeology that can currently differentiate female and male religious communities and their sites. They use the same monastic architectural vocabulary and so it is necessary to know from history if a site was used by female religious. As a result, it is likely that many sites, especially short-lived ones, were under the radar of written history and were never recorded as female religious communities. The concept of monasticism sprang up in the East in the late third to early fourth century AD and was based on a religious lifestyle of getting closer to God by removing oneself from the secular world into an enclosed space made sacred through prayer. Women were accommodated at this time, for example, in the Nile Delta, and there were also mixed communities. By the fourth century, Roman women were interested in monasticism, and by the 430s, it is traditionally accepted that Christianity had arrived with St. Patrick when he was sent to preach to the Irish believing in Christ which implies that there were already Christians in Ireland prior to his arrival. St. Patrick's writings mention veiled women, virgins and holy women. The flowering of Christianity in England, Scotland and Wales traditionally dates to the 7th century. And the map shown here shows female religious communities dating from the 9th to the 11th century. There are a number of female saints known from Britain and Hilda of Whitby is probably the most important dating to the 7th century. Much of what is known of Hilda is through the writings of Bede. For England, Sarah Foote has suggested that the majority of holy women of the early medieval period were individual vowesses who lived in their own homes, while the large, royal, wealthy Anglo-Saxon nunneries such as Barking, Ely and Winchester should be considered atypical to the norm. There are 51 sites currently associated with early medieval religious communities, and I have listed the more northerly examples, which may be more familiar to this audience. This should be considered an absolute minimum number, as Padraig O'Rean in his Dictionary of Irish Saints lists well over 100 female saints or saints mothers, who may too represent female religious communities, or perhaps be evidence of vowesses that Foote has identified in England. There are several evidential constraints with this group of sites and their reuse over a long period of time is a particular problem for the subsurface archaeology. So too is the fact that even after excavation, there is usually no distinctive archaeological evidence of a female community as at Ahave excavated by Rory O'Boyle. Ahave is associated with the female Saint Lassar, who is also associated with the 8th century book shrine, the Downock Arrogate. Of the many female saints known, only four have extant lives. Bridget of Kildare, Ita of Caledi County Limerick, Monina of Caledi County Armagh, and Savnan of Clonbrony County Longford and Clunburn County Offaly. Arguably, the most famous is Bridget of Kildare. Cogitosis's 7th century description of the great church at Kildare and its various archaeological interp interpretations 
and Raleigh Radford's interpretation published in the Ulster Journal of Archaeology is shown here, gives a glimpse into what a female community's church may have looked like. But it is also true to say that it is unknown if this was how all churches looked, or just those churches at Kildare, or indeed just the great church, which may have been special and unique. Unfortunately, none of the archaeology of this church is now known. Kildare's early medieval remains are sparse, with only the round tower remaining. The firehouse structure is likely medieval, later medieval in date, and is shown in the slide. There are about 10 female religious communities that are associated with larger complexes, and I call these satellite communities. The female communities in Armagh might be seen in this way, which is seen here and will probably be very familiar to most. Temple Neferta, or the Church of the Repository, and St Bridget's were close to, but not within the innermost monastic enclosure at Armagh. Both these early communities were also nunneries in the later medieval period, but whether this was a continuation of use or reuse after abandonment is currently not clear. In the 12th century, the process of reform of the church began in the island of Ireland. This was a process through a number of synods rather than a single event, which took many years to complete. Its purpose was to align the administration and the functioning of the church in Ireland with that of the continent and England, where the processes of reform had begun much earlier. Part of this reform was the introduction of continental religious orders. This was a completely different organisational structure to the early medieval period, which leads to a completely different archaeology. Later, medieval nunneries in Ireland were affiliated to several different religious orders, including Benedictine, Cistercian, Augustinian, Augustinian of Arawasian Observance and Franciscan, also known as the Poor Clares. Many medievalists, such as Janet Burton, have difficulties in assessing nunneries according to order, as, and I quote, to do this would be to squeeze women into categories which may better describe male rather than female con congregations. Unquote. Therefore, in most modern studies, women religious are considered as a separate group rather than men according to order or congregation. There are about 65 sites currently considered nunneries on the island of Ireland, of which half have some archaeological register. Their distribution is a little patchy, for example, Donegal and Kerry have none recorded, and it is thought that patterns of patronage have led to this distribution. Not all were in use at the same time. It is estimated that perhaps 20 to 25 may have been in use at any one time. The fervour of 12th century reform witnessed the majority of nunnery foundations, and you can look at the graph there, and through time their numbers declined. However, it would be wrong to interpret this as a decline in patronage. Rather, many of the earlier foundations continued to operate through the centuries, and so less new nunneries were required over time. There are five nunneries recorded in Northern Ireland, Derry London Derry, two at Armagh, Killeavy and Downpatrick. Interestingly, the two at Armagh were also early female communities and there is tentative evidence outlined by Brian Lacey to suggest that Derry London Derry also had an early female religious community. Unfortunately, the only upstanding archaeological evidence for any of these communities is at Killeavy. The nunnery at Derry London Derry was founded in 1218 for Cistercian nuns. By, 12, by 1512, it was recorded that it had neither abbess nor nuns and that its revenues were being misappropriated, and it was suggested at that time that it be annexed to Melifont. The nunnery is thought to lie beneath St. Columns Cathedral. The nunnery at Downpatrick was founded by the Bagnall family sometime in the 12th century and was in ruins by 1513. It was either Benedictine or Cistercian. The precise location of the nunnery is unclear. Some suggest the cathedral, while others suggest it was adjacent to the nuns' gate in the town. Chapel Neferta, or the Church of the Repository, a nunnery in Armagh, is thought to have stood on its early medieval counterpart. There are no upstanding remains, but excavations uncovered early medieval burials, and these were published in UJA by Chris Lane in 1988. Later excavations by McDowell uncovered a rectangular structure 
interpreted as part of the nunnery. There are no upstanding remains of St. Bridget's in Armagh. Both foundations are thought to have been Augustinian of Arawasian observance. Kilivi was an early medieval establishment associated with St. Monina. It probably adopted the Augustinian of Arawasian observance in the 1140s. It was first recorded in 1146 when the great store of the nuns was damaged. The nunnery was dissolved in 1542, being valued at 40 shillings, and the last recorded abbess was Alicia O'Hanlon. The upstanding remains of the site comprise two churches known as the East and West Churches, now conjoined but originally separate, with the West Church earlier dating to the 11th or 12th century and the East Church dating to the 13th. Several windows are extant al along with a reused early doorway in the West Church and an ex situ granite early cross slab or mensa shown in the photograph. There are a number of popular perceptions associated with nunneries that current archaeological and historical evidence does not support, and we will briefly consider some here. For example, there is a perception that women patronise nunneries. For Ireland, however, there are only three instances where this is recorded. The nuns' church in Clamacnoise, where Derville, daughter of the King of Meath, completed the church there in 1167, at Cork, where the recluse Agnes de Hereford was formally approached to found a community in 1297, and the foundation of Liz Mullen by Alice de la Corner, the sister of the Bishop of Meath, in 1240. In medieval England, the Queen was the, pa the official patron of all nunneries in the kingdom, though this was probably a figurehead role rather than any practical assistance for most nunneries. It is likely that many more nunneries were established by women than is recorded. Thompson suggests that many women in England were the catalyst of their husband's and father's patronage and benefaction, though their input would not be recorded in the documentation. Along with the introduction of the Continental Orders came a cloistral plan, which for many years was considered essential and the standard for every religious house. There is a perception that all nunneries also used a cloistral plan, comprising a church and ranges of buildings arranged around a central courtyard or garth. But when the totality of the evidence is considered, it is likely that perhaps as few as 10 nunneries in Ireland ever used a fully developed cloister plan. And indeed, not all male religious houses use them either. Of the three upstanding cloistral nunneries in Ireland, Cologne County Clare dating to 1190, St. Catherine's County Limerick dating to the 1240s and Molock County Tipperary dating to the 14th century, all illustrate a variety in the cloister form in their final phases. Therefore, there is no such thing as a distinct medieval nunnery architecture. They employed the grammar of religious house architecture, but to their own individual needs. The realisation then highlights a diversity of layout in churches with attached and freestanding accommodation, as can be identified at churches associated with nuns, such as Tisrara County Roscommon, Anna Down County Galway, and especially at Inishmain County Mayo. There continues to be an assumption and expectation that all nunneries were strictly enclosed, with lay people kept out and nuns confined within high walls. But Diane Hall's historical analysis of nuns' interactions with the world illustrates what she terms the permeable cloister. Notwithstanding the partial upstanding remains of nunneries, the complete lack of archaeological evidence for high enclosing walls around nunnery precincts, as can be seen here at the male religious house at Kells in County Kilkenny, it suggests that for many nunneries their enclosure was more symbolic rather than having any material expression in the landscape. There was also a perception that nunneries were deliberately situated in isolated locations. There is, this certainly does appear to be the case of nunneries in England, but is not the case in Ireland, where most nunneries are either within settlements or within easy walking distance of a contemporary settlement, whether that be a walled town, unenclosed village, settlement cluster or castle. The slide shows just a sample of walled towns in Ireland that have recorded nunneries indicated by the star either within their walls or close by. 
This contrasts with medieval England, where only two nunneries, Chester and Ilchester, are located within town defences. Prescribed distance rules between male and female religious houses are often quoted. For example, 1216, the Cistercian stated that a nunnery must be at least six leagues, which is nearly 30 kilometres, from a male house, and 10 leagues from another nunnery. These rules were rarely, if ever, achieved in practice on the ground, and in many cases, female and male religious communities lived in close proximity, some for a time as co-located communities, as at Arik Carran County Roscommon or Term and Feck in County Louth. These are considered a distinct phenomenon from the mixed double house orders of England and the continent, such as the Gilbertines, and an example of their order and their double cloister is shown on the slide. Co-located houses in Ireland may have indeed been experimental in the 12th century and in a failed experiment at that, as by the 13th century, most had become single sexed with either the male community or the nuns moving to another location. The letters of Stephen of Lexington recording his visitations to Cistercian houses in Ireland in 1228 show that he was indignant that the monasteries of Jerpoint, Inishlaunacht and Melifant all had communities of nuns in close proximity. Unfortunately, we currently have no indication of where these female communities might have lived at those locations. The traditional narrative for the economy of medieval nunneries is that when compared to male religious houses, particularly Cistercian monasteries, they were invariably mismanaged and poor. More recent studies show, however, that this narrative is skewed. Gilchrist and others have shown that unlike male houses, nunneries may never have been intended to be self-sufficient. Furthermore, as they follow different economic paths, nunnery states did not have to be consolidated or managed in the same way as the wool-producing Cistercian monasteries, for example. Lyon's study of religious houses in Kildare show that nunneries, shown here in red, compared very favourably to their male counterparts in their dissolution evaluations. And finally, the perception of scandal and so-called naughty nuns. This has become a trope in literary tradition, but literary tradition and historical reality are probably somewhat different. But when scandalous events did occur, they were likely exaggerated, with the more salacious tabloid aspects of the stories tending to focus on the female party. This is because the accounts of such scandals are usually written by men, who may have had their own agendas, and when pregnancy resulted from these liaisons, it was the women who showed the physical signs and were literally left holding the baby. It clearly took two for these liaisons to occur, as historical accounts for dispensation show. There are several records where would-be clerics needed papal dispensation from the defect of their birth, as their parents are recorded as bishops, priests, monks and nuns. I am very grateful to have been part of this conference, and in this 20 minutes or so, I hope I've given you a flavour of the archaeology of female monasticism in medieval Ireland. Female monasticism and nuns were not an inferior form or somehow deviant to a male monasticism. Nunneries were not the same as male religious houses and were probably never meant to be, and so they should not be directly compared. By debunking some of the myths, I hope I have highlighted some of the ways that female monasticism might be considered differently and produced some interesting alternative to the more traditional narrative. And now to my shameless plug. If you would like to rediscover more, please take a look at my monograph published recently by Cork University Press. And if you sign up to the newsletter, you will receive a 20% discount on all its titles. Many thanks for your time and attention.